surface of the deep, but the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Good afternoon. I'm so glad to be with you today as we reflect on the Holy Spirit, the one who was with God at creation and who brings the new life of Christ right into the deeps of our hearts. The Spirit is also the one who knits us together in worship, even though we are separated by space and some of us are separated even by time. A few announcements before we continue in our worship. I want to thank again so much Deanne Diller, who is continuing to offer her musicianship for our benefit, and it is such a gift. I am very grateful. Thank you so much. And another note about music. Today we'll be using uh, YouTube for our hymn singing, and we hope, I think there are lyrics with all of the YouTube videos, so we hope you join in wherever you are. Uh, Bible study this week will only be on channel two at 10 o'clock on Friday morning, and as you might expect, if you have been part of the Bible study, this week we'll be studying Psalm 73. And it is likely that next week's chapel will also only be on channel uh, two. So please watch your bulletin boards to stay up on the latest information. I think that's it. Let us pray together. Come Holy Spirit, enter our silences. Come, Holy Spirit, into the depths of our longing. Come, Holy Spirit, 
Enter our trusting, enter our fearing, enter our letting go, enter our holding back. Come Holy Spirit, set us free. Amen. Our next, our first song is when I heard the voice of Jesus say, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? God bless you, Jill, as you open the word to us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chaplain Anita. Good afternoon. If you have an order of worship, I would ask you to turn to the back. Maybe some of you who are watching do not have this, and that's okay, you can just listen. Um, on the back of the order of worship, we have the scripture, and then there's a picture. And the picture has some, some rods or logs, and I'm asking you a question, how many logs are there? Hmm. Sometimes when I look at it, I see three. How many logs do you see? Does anyone see four? <laughs> if you look at the left, there are four logs. But if you look on the right side, there are three logs. What? <laughs> My brain just can't quite figure this out. Um, <laughs> I wonder if Nicodemus felt this way about Jesus. You know, um, he is, he just couldn't figure Jesus out. And we'll get into that in a minute. But as Anita just read, John 3, 1 says, Now there was a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night. Now after reading this first verse, I already have a couple of questions. Who is Nicodemus? And why does he come to Jesus? So Nicodemus, we see here that he is a Pharisee. He is a member of the Jewish Council of the Sanhedrin, which um, is the highest Jew Jewish authority in Israel. So Nicodemus has received lots of formal training in the Talmud, the central text of the Jewish law, and he was a high-ranking, well-respected leader, for sure. And Nicodemus sees this man, this Jesus, and he can't quite make sense of him. He looks like a normal guy, a regular person, but he's doing things that a normal person doesn't normally do. Like earlier in John, he drove out all the merchants from the temple courts, and then he turned jars of water into wine at a wedding. How did he do that? Jesus not, does not have extensive formal education like Nicodemus or other Pharisees, and yet when he teaches, he teaches with authority. And he brings these amazing insights into the scriptures that others hadn't noticed before. Jesus definitely stands out in a crowd, and he is noticed, including um, the Jewish leaders have noticed him. So Nicodemus is curious about Jesus. He wants to know more, but he doesn't come to Jesus in the daytime, in the synagogue where Jesus might be teaching. He comes to Jesus at night. Why do you think that is? There are probably numerous reasons, but the one I thought of was that I wonder if Nicodemus was worried how other people would think of him. He, a well-respected, prestigious Pharisee, interacting with such a radical, non-traditional teacher such as Jesus. But since Nicodemus' curiosity has gotten the best of him, he asked to meet with Jesus at night, maybe to protect himself from public suspicion. Nicodemus begins the conversation in verse 2 by saying to Jesus, Rabbi? Now, Rabbi, he calls him Rabbi. He's a teacher. He gave him that respect. I know you must be from God, for no one could do the things you do if God wasn't with you. The weird thing is, Jesus doesn't respond to this statement at all. Like you would expect in a normal conversation, Jesus would say, ah, yes, or something. Nope, he just ignores that whole statement. Instead, he starts talking about birth, <laughs> about being born. What? Jesus cuts to the chase. He goes straight for the matter at hand. And this is one thing I just love about Jesus. He can see deeply into the hearts of people and know what needs to be addressed. And of course, at this point, Nicodemus isn't even aware of his need, and he becomes confused by Jesus' words. Jesus says in verse 3, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. And Nicodemus says to him, How can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time in the mother's womb and be born? Is this a riddle? Is this a puzzle? 
Maybe Nicodemus felt like we did when we looked at those longs on the back of our, that optical illusion on the back of our order of worship. It just doesn't make sense. And Nicodemus, his mind, can't understand him. I don't blame him. I don't know that I would have either if I was him, but let's take a look here. What is Jesus saying by being born again. Now we have the privilege of being able to be 2,000 years later and have the whole Old Testament and New Testament and can put pieces together, but what was Jesus saying when he originally said this? My NRSV translation says born again, and that's what we used here on the paper, but some other translations say from above. You must be born from above or born from God. This is from the Greek word, and I don't pronounce Greek well, so anothen, I think is how you say it. And it can be translated also as you must be born completely or from the beginning or for the second time. Poor Nicodemus, he really does want to understand what Jesus is telling him, but he cannot see the spiritual meaning that Jesus is referring to. Why do you think he can't see it? Well, Jesus actually gives him that answer in verse 3, and again in verse 5, he says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they have been born again. Unless they have a true conversion, a complete change, a new start from God above, you will not see the kingdom of God. And he continues in verse 5 with a stronger statement, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. In other words, it seems like Jesus is saying, you're not going to understand anything about me, about Jesus, about God's kingdom, until you have been born of the spirit. Unless you have received the eternal spirit of God, unless you have had a conversion, you will not understand. So Nicodemus is even more confused, and in verse 9 he says, how can this be? He's not understanding, is he? <laughs> and I don't condemn Nicodemus here. In fact, I can kind of identify with him. I have this insatiable desire to understand things. I want to know the whys and the hows. I want to know that things make sense, and if they don't, I get frustrated, and sometimes I kind of get fixated on finding an answer. You know, God gave us our intellects, our natural curiosity, our desire to learn. God gave us minds to question, analyze, problem solve. These are gifts in which God delights. In fact, I wonder if that's one reason why Jesus spoke like he did. You know, in parables or analogies like being born again to describe spiritual matters. Parables, analogies, riddles, they all captivate our minds. They evoke thought, they intrigue us, and they engage God, our God-given intellect. But Jesus is saying here that there is another way to know things, a different wisdom to be had, a wisdom that doesn't come from our intellect or our flesh. This wisdom is the Spirit. It's from the Spirit of God. And it, instead, it's not a human perspective, but a heavenly or eternal perspective. Yes, we are human. Yes, we are flesh. And we are spiritual beings who have access to the spiritual realm through receiving Jesus' Spirit. So without having received the Spirit, without having been born again, we cannot fully be who God designed us to be. Without relying on the Spirit in our own lives, we can strain our brains trying to make sense of life, trying to meet our challenges in our own strength and understanding, and often this leads us to dead ends. But Jesus says we have access to his Spirit, who teaches us things that are beyond human understanding, beyond our flesh. In John 14, before Jesus left his disciples, he said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him 
because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. When the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you everything I have told you. Wow, what a relief. <laughs> it's not just up to us to figure out life, to make things happen, to understand and solve our problems and the world's problems, to convince people to follow Jesus. It's not all uh, up to us. God gave us his spirit. So, how do we access the spirit's wisdom? Uh, this is a silly little example, but I wonder if you think of a remote control and you know how you can change the channels. I believe maybe we have an intuitive channel we can change to um, and tune into. Um, we can change the channel from our minds, our intellect, our ego, and we ask the spirit for wisdom. It's kind of like changing the channel. Wait a minute. <laughs> I can't figure this out. I need you, Jesus, to help me. Um, so sometimes you hear people saying, I have this gut feeling. <laughs> That's intuition. I believe that that comes from the Holy Spirit. If we open ourselves and ask for help, the Holy Spirit can guide us with our gut feelings. Um, our intuition. Um, we also, I'm sure you've heard this, that God speaks in that deep or that small, still voice within us. I've had that happen at times when I'm quiet and listening. Sometimes the Spirit speaks to us through the scriptures or what someone tells us or a song that we hear and it just sticks with us and it just kind of feels alive in us. That's the Holy Spirit as well. Very different from book knowledge and learning and our intellect, isn't it? Sometimes we miss out on what the Spirit is saying in here, what, no, in our hearts, <laughs> because we're up here in our heads trying to figure out everything. At least that's true for me. Our craving to understand with our minds can be a way of grasping for control. If we understand something, we master it. If we can't understand something, we feel helpless or vulnerable. Our egos fight so hard against being in a place of weakness and vulnerability. Sometimes I fight so hard with reality, I don't like what's happening, that it keeps me, though, from receiving the Spirit's wisdom. I'm putting so much energy against what's happening and fighting against it that I can't hear that small, still voice. I'm not open and receptive. Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. Grasping for understanding and control just gives birth to more flesh, dead ends. We were never meant to navigate life on this earth without God's spirit, but we sure try. Jesus calls Nicodemus into completely new territory. He invites him to give up his ego's reliance on his proper lineage, his social status, his current belief system, and to move out into the realm of the spirit. What about you and I? I sense Jesus is calling us to move into new territory as well. If you haven't yet been born again, haven't yet asked God's spirit to come and enter and forgive and cleanse and fill you today just might be a good day for that. I'm guessing that many who are listening today have already received the gift of Jesus' Spirit dwelling within, but maybe we need to be reminded again, at least I do, over and over again to rely on the Spirit. True conversion never stops. If we are willing, conversion continues to evolve in us at ever new levels of insight and reliance on God and God's Spirit. Where do you think Jesus is inviting you to rely on the Spirit, to trust at an ever deeper level? In what challenging situation is Jesus asking you to surrender to the Spirit's presence within you, 
knowing that wisdom and understanding will come in time. I wrote about a woman in the August edition of our newsletter, The Villa Vista. Um, she was struggling with the suicide of her son. She had so much grief, so many questions. And these questions were eating her up inside, destroying her life. So she decided to write down the questions, each question as they came. And she put them in a jar labeled questions to ask when I get to heaven. She decided through that little ritual of writing her questions down and putting them in the jar to stop fighting, stop trying to figure it out, to stop trying to make sense and surrender to the reality that was before her and trusting that someday she will know more. It has been said by a teacher in Thailand, his name was Ajin Cha, if I'm saying that correctly, if you let go a little, you'll find a little peace. If you let go a lot, you'll find a lot of peace. And if you let go absolutely, you'll find absolute peace and tranquility. I would like more peace and tranquility. How about you? <laughs> Does more peace really come from letting go? I invite you again to think about a situation in your life that is creating a challenge for you. I have some questions to consider. How much are you relying on yourself in this situation? And are you willing to loosen your grasp for control, your need to make sense of it all, and surrender to the Spirit? Are you willing to invite the Spirit to birth something new in you in the midst of your challenges? Let's close in prayer. God, you are creative and powerful beyond our comprehension. You are full of mystery. We give thanks to you who births new life within us and life into our difficult, unsolvable situations. As we navigate our challenges, we release our reliance upon our own wisdom and invite your spirit to dwell in us anew. We surrender our need to know our need to control, and we desire to rely on your spirit for guidance, creativity, and peace. Give us acceptance and patience with the unknown and deepen our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
before we go to prayer this afternoon, I just want to let you know about two folks we lost in the past week. First of all, we lost Kathy Weaver, uh, who is mother-in-law to Chaplain Jill, uh, who died Sunday afternoon. She was a resident of Arbor Vista and then more recently in PRA. And then Don Schroeder died yesterday afternoon and he was a resident of West Gardens. And we will be praying for Kathy and Don's families this afternoon and invite your continued prayer for them. Let us pray. We bring our prayers to you this afternoon, O oh God, you who are three in one and one in three. You have made a way for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and you renew and restore the whole of ourselves with the gift of your Holy Spirit. Help us to surrender day by day to what you want to do in and through us so that we may live with you in confident joy, in peace, in tranquility. This afternoon, O oh God, we lift up those who grieve. Especially, we pray for the families of Kathy Weaver and Don Schroeder, and we ask your sustaining help and hope for them. Thank you that we can trust that Kathy and Don are safe in your presence. We also lift up to you all residents and staff in this season of COVID. Please surround our residents and staff with your hope and with your healing and with your wisdom. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us, your servants, an expanse of mercy and grace that is beyond our limited understanding. Please keep us steadfast in faith and in worship and bring us at the end to see you in your one and eternal God at glory one God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns together forever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, as we close, receive this blessing. May the peace of God reign in your heart, and the love of God forever hold you tight. May the Spirit of God 
flow through your life and the joy of God uphold you day and night. Amen and go in peace. Thank you.